your expectations from the lift network so are you looking at collaborations or co-selling or like in the whole licensing or, or what is your expectations from the network i think we have been looking at more efficient soil testing we have been looking at more efficient monitoring ai powered and so forth we have been looking at more irrigation and, and automated irrigation platforms what we have is the market for those products all right hi lifers out there today we have a very interesting lifer from all the way from kenya and he is stephen from plus farms he's an agritech startup and he's been part of the lift 4 and also the lift advance 2022 cohort so stephen welcome to the liffy podcast Thank you very much for having me, Raj. Right, and, uh, and Stephen, in, in one sentence, if you can talk to us uh, about your journey or about your startup, like, you know, um, uh, for all of the listeners to get a, just a feel about um, what your startup is all about, then it'd be very interesting for us to know. Um, to understand what platform stands for, you'll have to go back, I think, to, you could go back to my childhood, but let's go back to college, uh, where um, I think my friends and I met, my co-founders, and we were part of a student's entrepreneurship group called the Nactas, where we could come up with ideas, make prototypes, go to competitions and so on. So we had this one very interesting product, which we called the Fida Maza, which was just translates to profitable produce. Um, Fida Maza was supposed to be a cold storage powered by solar energy for rural farmers and uh, women vendors in, in marketplaces. Uh, that program or project took us to different forums. First, it was the Consumer Goods Forum in South Africa in 20, I think, 16 or 17, thereabout, and to the LEAF program in the UK in 2018. So, ends LEAF 4. Um, at that point, um, which was just uh, more of an idea than anything else, a very business oriented person, young man at the time. And, and since then, um, we got a lot of mentorship through the LEAF program, so we had prototypes, we got some funding, so we made some interesting products and so forth. But as time went on, we realized that it needed more technical abilities than we could offer. So we pivoted to providing services to farmers, something that also had become clear through our journey that farmers wanted help with, you know, managing their farms, especially with you know, rural urban migration, people are leaving their farms at home to farm sons and managers and so forth, but there's little professionalism in that. So what Plasform does today is we manage those farms on behalf of investors, we call them agribusiness investors, and then we get paid in terms of consultancy fees and and so on. So yeah, that's where we are at at the moment. Wow, wow. So, so multiple pivots, friends coming together, uh, Lyft adding a lot of value in terms of mentorship uh, and now you're giving uh, consultancy and you know services like you know professional services to farmers and so so like you know in, interesting journey and I'm gonna go deeper in that but before that uh, I was just curious when I was going you know reading a lot about you that your designation uh, in, in, in plus farms is of a team leader uh, and not of a CEO so what's the story behind that um, like you know so uh, it could be interesting for us to know as well um, I think from a very early age I realized that I was a leader of people more than anything and um, through those different programs I'm talking about in high school and so forth and, and in college I was the team team leader and and in diff some of them I was called the president others I was called other names and so forth but all through I've always wanted to be known as a leader of people not just you know an executive a high ranking executive in fancy suits and so forth so really our work today at Plasform is a people oriented business that's what we are we are people oriented business I lead and manage a team ranging from people with master's degrees to guys that never went to high school. And, and the only thing that resonates with that sort of level and sort of leadership is being a team leader, okay? Offering my support and understanding and association to these people that I love so much um, is what makes me proud to call myself more of a team leader than a CEO, because most of my decisions are not really that complex to make, really. They're just empathizing and being kind and so forth and, and connecting people and networking. The thing that's the work of 
a team leader mostly. So it's it's something that I take a lot of pride in being called a team leader. And and obviously there are spaces where I'll be known as a CEO. If I go to the British High Commission EI, they will introduce me as the CEO of Blasphem as they do. But really I'm more proud being introduced as a team leader because I'm proud of my team. I love my team and there's nothing better that I would rather do than leave them. Yeah. Wow. So that's that's like you know. So a, a lot of us have as leaders understanding of the perspective that you spoke, but executing it in in the way in terms of being multifaceted, like you know, with the team or with customers or with people, uh, using the name team leader to become more approachable for them. I think that's very beautifully amazing that you're doing. And then again, uh, like you know, in other places where you would want to be positioned yourself as a decision maker, you're positioning yourself as a CEO. So that's pretty awesome. Yes. Um, uh, and now going a little bit deeper into the product, like you know, so so you start in 2019, as you said, with with your friends, uh, and and there would have been multiple pivots. Uh, so so what has been your maybe favorite pivot so far? And and eventually, right now, Plus Farms, you spoke about that you give after the pivots, you give now consultancy services. But do you have a, a, is it like a custom consultancy or do you have a fixed product that you? Churn with every customer, or or is that a software, or is that just conversations, or is there any hardware involved? Uh, so so, what is the product that at the end right now Plus Farm gives? And to reach that stage, what are the pivots that you have taken so far? Uh, first of all, it's a bit of everything. I think over over from after pivoting from the research and development of our solar powered boardrooms, because like I mentioned, our lack of technical skills was not giving if i could use the gen z language and and at that particular point um we felt that there were more room for us to participate in the agricultural value chains because that was still agricultural value chains and as more people came to us different requests we we have been malleable we have been very flexible to the demands of the market and so forth and, and i think to me that's what makes a good business person which i consider myself um so the first pivot was pivoting from cold rooms to the service side of things but specifically offering services to farmers african farmers for that matter do not pay for services okay mm -hmm. this is entrenched in a cultural support from ngos governments and so forth so they don't pay for services mm -hmm. but we were able and we have been able to show farmers the difference between paying for a service for the service and just waiting for the free stuff from government or the uh, development, the more they see the difference, the more they adopt our services, the more they they want that. And for platform to be able to, you know, scale, services are not that easy to scale. Mm -hmm. For platform to be able to scale that service, we need platforms, we need digital platforms. Farmers communicate to farmers and schedule visits and so forth. And we pair these platforms, we have a very amazing Farm management platform called Palms, which is Plus Farm Agribusiness Management System, which pairs, you know, our rural or agents to the farms, and then they can communicate with each other. And at the apex of it, we can control, we can see what's happening, and we can, we can be able to manage uh, situations before they, they they go wrong or before it's too late. So that's also another iteration from just purely, you know, service or you pass on to pass on service to a digital platform aided service and now we're integrating hardware in into the mix where now we have indoor monitoring uh, technologies we have cameras where farmers can often sort of stream what is happening at their farms especially farmers that or rather farm owners that are outside the country and they want to feel like they are participating in the process of their pro projects so we have we have cameras where they can stream through their portals can see what is happening they can see probably who is stealing from them mm -hmm. if they so wish so that level of uh connection where we are taking a farm owner that is far from the farm and make them feel like they are part of a process mm -hmm. is our unique service offering at the moment no one else is doing that as far as i know and we continue 
to enhance what we are doing. You know, we are incorporating AI. We are talking to partners in the field of AI to be able to do monitoring for for you know crops, to do communication, to be to answer and assist uh, our business, our service providers, and so forth. So the future is interesting. A lot more iterations and so on, but the core still remains to support farmers. Well. I think it's very interesting that you start also using cameras for them to real time stream and then exploring other areas and then you understood that these guys are used to free things and paid can only they can only once they taste it they get to know how they feel about the paid ones and it's a very interesting use case especially and again the cultural aspect of I think is very very unique for to us to understand the customers now to go a little bit more uh into like you know have you been able to solve the problem is that these are farmers so how how has your marketing been so how have you been able to market to to the farmers um, um like you know so what is because it's a very tough bunch of customers to add on um right because uh, like you know they have their own perspective set change and they don't want the new things to come in and then go off or like you know and again especially from startups um that the, the, because to change their their daily operations and this tech and everything so what, what has been your marketing or, or have you done some very interesting ways like you did with team leader uh, with your designation itself so so how have you been marketing the, with these people or, or if you could talk about the first customer uh, who got on board or anything so anything yeah so yeah i think the first customer that came in and i think that gave us a lot of view into into what we were looking at was someone that is based in the US, okay? That um, we were linked with by a local friend of mine who told me that this person has a project, they're struggling with their family members, their family members are eating the money. Uh, can you help them? Okay, so I got into a call with the lady, gave her a plan and we started working. And we have this particular joke within our company that if you pick a stone and throw at the city centers in in africa anyway in africa i think mostly you're very likely to hit a farmer mm. okay or someone who identifies as a farm they have a farm that is neglected or they have they have their second and they do second on hand or that hand farming where they're supporting their mother to farm mm. and we realize we might not have a good time convincing the farmer that is based in the rural center or the rural area because first of all they are very set on their ways and they also don't have the resources to pay for our services. So what's the point? So we, we, we have gone all the way and invested in urban marketing. So we have, we organize town halls with, with people that are interested in agribusiness. So we bring them, uh, we go to trade fairs. As long as they uh, attend by some real estate guys trying to sell real estate as an investment option we are also selling agribusiness as an investment option to these people and as such we have sort of been able to bring money back to agriculture which is something that wasn't happening before and by doing so we have able to be first of all reach a niche that was not being reached and secondly create also our own clients mm -hmm. and but the beauty of creating your own market is no one is going to take that away from you easily as long as you're doing a good job in it, in it. so that's that, for me the idea was to discover very early on that we had a niche and our niche wasn't the small order farmer that is sub producing for subsistence mm -hmm. it was the farmer that wants to use agriculture as a revenue generating adventure mm -hmm. so we have been able to do that the second thing is that Kenya today has a very, very youthful generation. This youthful generation has no interest particularly to go to the farm and farm the way your parents and grandparents used to do. They want someone to be able to do for them. They can they can take the name, the name farmer, but they don't necessarily care about working to go to the farm every day. So we make sure that happens. We make sure that the lawyer, the doctor, the teacher and so forth are still having the agribusiness projects and they're managing them and they're getting their check. So it's, it, it, I think it was sort of a niche that we discovered and we continue to exploit at the moment. 
and every single time they realize that we're making other farmers money they're coming away um every i have clients from the very top of government to the you know to just your usual high school teachers and so forth so it's it's an interesting side of business and as technology evolves then there's only i don't think there's a limit to how much we can we can do to help them mm. and and yeah I, i think i think i think without talking about this too much i can talk this about this forever because i'm really passionate about these topics mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very interesting so uh, so you found the niche uh, farmers for example these guys who are like you know in different businesses uh, of example but they want to manage their agri tech business as well and you help them manage this and getting them more roi um so interesting part uh, our i just want to understand that um you are doing um, like you know the the initial innovation of the solar example the refrigeration for farmers and then you pivoted to this model um so even in this case uh, like w- what has been your learning in this pivot uh, in context of commercialization from r&d because this is an r&d project uh, and then you moved on to a services project right so Uh, so being technical yes the rd so because we have a lot of lifers who are technical uh, and like you know so we would want to know uh, what has been your learning so far powered cold rooms in kenya particularly um at that particular moment i think we were we were very early we were some of the first people to be talking about it so most people were, were thinking we were crazy it was interesting and so forth to today there are a lot of more people that are exploring that space they are still in r and d and any technical person especially someone who has done a little bit of of engineering and and thermodynamics and so forth can tell you how complex that space is and uh, the level of inefficiencies that we have because i remember the during that time i reached out to some guy that was doing some research with nasa about the sam and even they were struggling efficient wise okay mm-hmm. they what they were telling me that economically it's difficult to make this work because you need too much investment you're not going to break even and so forth and so forth. Mm-hmm. and and through i think leaf leaf as well um and and um steve clevery and, and the other gentlemen that we were were mentoring us, us at the time they also helped us do some background research and, and so forth and it was not looking good okay mm-hmm. and I'm a, I'm a very practical person a practical person in such a sense that I don't care how much grants I'm attracting as long as this thing does not seem to have a commercialization future they, they, there's no point for me at the time we were I think we got a grant we were attracting grants and I could have played the, the, the game I could have played the game for as long as I want I would still be here playing the game but I realized at that time that it wasn't something that i wanted to do because i wanted to be able to support my community i didn't want to be cooking stories every now and then for social media and so forth mm-hmm. so the pivoting was more of a moral responsibility for me mm-hmm. and a self realization of my capacities and capabilities i have no engineering background I'm a, I'm a business i was a business student at the time mm-hmm. and as such i just wanted something that i can wake up in the morning and be excited to do mm. and and this this pivoting was informed by that so when it comes to r&d into projects mm. i feel like there are a lot of especially in africa there's a lot of funding for projects that do not have any technical future mm. and they they are being they're being obviously encouraged by money money encouraging that encouraging that sort of thing and and obviously as long as some people are getting money they are comfortable with whatever they're doing but some people also i know that do not believe in what they're doing mm-hmm. they don't believe it's going to work and i don't see the point in doing that but people are different mm-hmm. but i would say for anyone who has their heart at the right place mm-hmm. um research and development you should only invest your time and i'm not talking about money here please i'm talking about time because you're not going to get your time back that's mm-hmm. it right you should only invest your time in something that you see a future in mm. um that you see that it changes the communities the way we say we want to change our communities to build our community and so forth so i would say 
there are a lot of exciting projects out of our countries and developing world in particular. Mm -hmm. And I will say people that believe in what they are doing and the technical points to a success story, I would like to say they stay, they stick to it. You don't have to pivot just to look cool, you know. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a totally a logical, technical decision to make. Mm. Do you have what it takes to turn this around? If, if not, I don't think you see the point. And that's the assessment that we did, that we were very honest with ourselves. We mm. ourselves, you don't have what it takes to, to turn this around. And, and, and we, you know, pivoted, yeah. Well, that's it. I see like very practical of you in terms of the business side. So the business side of you is like very, very, um, sensible in terms of like you know uh, structuring so I'm also again a business founder so uh, uh, being a computer engineer but still very business and I feel you I mean like you know I feel in context with the aspect that it should make sense it should be logical it should do all the good things but it, and also it should make money like you know so it should not just be making money but it should do if that should also be a part of it so I think it's very well nicely that you said now we've spoken, spoken a lot about your company and the value you add for like you know uh, 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 farmers or example the people who are looking at agri-tech business and how you're adding value to them in context of the services uh, as a platform as like you know a tech product in terms of the cameras monitoring farmers so again lift is uh, as you know it's a, it's a huge community of uh, lifters across 17 plus countries uh, and like you know and, and and there could be a lot of collaborations that can happen so and, and I know, or, or you, as you said, that you're already looking, you were doing collaboration with some other AI companies for bringing AI into your business. And you and Lyft has got a lot of startups who are more into R&D. So, so there could be a lot of collaboration as well, because you look, you seem as if you're very good in the business side and the R&D could add value to you in terms of the layers, getting things done. So, so, so what are your expectations from the Lyft network? So are you looking at collaborations or co-selling or like you know, co-licensing or, or, or what is your expectations from the network? I, I think um, the Leaf community is a very rich group of, of technical abilities especially. And like I mentioned, it's, it's not necessarily our strength. And we outsource most of the technical stuff that we do. So any partnerships in the, in the side of technicalities, um, I think we have been looking at more efficient soil testing we have been looking at more efficient monitoring, uh, AI powered and so forth. We have been looking at more efficient irrigation and, and automated uh, irrigation platforms. What we have is the market for those products. Mm -hmm. So even the companies that we are co collaborating with, they're just developing for a market that is ready to obtain. And, and I think while, while we need those technical um, aspects of other startups and so forth we also offer in return a ready market from tech we we know how to sell i know how to sell tech i know how to sell to my clients um and so forth so any partnership that could be mutually beneficial okay whether whether it's um, in commercialization of tech whether it's in testing of that tech because I'm also participating in some programs where we are testing some tech for startups and so forth with farmers, with, you know, real actual farmers and, and real actual people that can be able to relay data in real time and accurate data for that matter, because it's in our interest that those, those things work. So we are sort of, we have all sort of put our skin in the game, in the technical space. And I've told you that I'm a very practical person in the sense that I know what I don't have, I know what I have, and I know what I need to do to get what I don't have, and I know what to give out so that I can also get what I don't have. So such partnerships and, and such collaborations for me are extremely uh, welcome, and I'm open to those conversations. I'm also open to conversations of how to make our own product better, whether it's, you know, the, the digital platforms that we are working on, how can we incorporate different aspects of AI into the same so that they can we can have you know virtual assistants and so forth that can support farmers, especially farmers at the lower level that might not be able to afford our services. Um, there is an aspect of my business. I don't know whether we call it the heart of the business, which is uh, we want to be able to help communities that might not be able to afford our services. Mm -hmm. 
and we have training clinics for farmers in rural areas, free clinics and so forth. We fundraise through projects for to be able to support those communities and so forth. So even when we are talking about technology, I'm very much interested in technology that can support that group as well. The AI that can support rural communities uh, to, you know, deal with stuff like climate change, mm. to deal with food waste mm. and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think I'm open to collaboration when it comes to technologies, research and development and, and anything that is out there. So just shoot at me. Perfect. And I think um, also the platform that you have built uh, because I've spoken to a lot of lifters, but I've never heard someone with a platform as for managed services for farming, and uh, and and that could be very helpful in countries like Vietnam, India, or the other countries where farming is again a big chunk of the work that they do. Uh, so I think I see that possibility of the same solution that you have, but maybe language changed or maybe iterated to a little bit of tuned flavor going to that city's countries as well. So that's a very interesting aspect and the collaborations, as you said, you are looking at technical collaborations from lifers in the tech AI space or example, uh, like, you know, but, but are, do you have specific countries in mind or specific segments in mind? One, one segment you spoke about is AI, do you have any other segments or specific lift countries in mind or, or is it like, how is it? I, I think in agriculture, generally, the things that apply the most um, is machine learning, the internet of things, mm -hmm. and, and that's where the monitors and so forth come in. And then there's AI. Those particular three, I think those for me are very important. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, there's also mechanization, right? Mm -hmm. There's mechanization. Uh, in, in, uh, mechanization is lacking in African agriculture. Mm -hmm. And it's lacking because they are really not enough mechanization for the smaller scale uh, farmers in africa and i and i think india does very well in that space especially asian countries to, to be more general does very well in mechanization of farms in a smaller scale so i would say any products that could help our farmers produce more could help our farmers save more on resources um, would be welcome as well so yeah but particularly um i would i would love you know, to work with entrepreneurs and researchers and developers from from India. Mm -hmm. I'd love to work with entrepreneurs from South Africa as well. Mm -hmm. I think as well, I think also I would love to work with Latin America because and the reason why I'm picking those spaces is because I know there's in they are in leaf, but I also know that our our economies are not that far apart, and as such. Even the level of agriculture, the nature of agriculture mm -hmm. is almost similar. Mm -hmm. And as such, you can easily replicate models, mm -hmm. even for farm management on the other side, you can easily replicate it um, uh, on, on whichever market that you move, mm -hmm. as long as it's within that scope. So yeah, that's, that's that sort of thing. Yeah. Perfect. And I think I can relate to it because I was in Mexico like a couple of months ago and it's crazy in terms of the farming and the lands that they have because they obviously have the vodka from the cactus and they have farming of cactus as well. That was a shock to me because I tried cactus as well uh, for the first time. And uh, so yeah, so again Mexico and again it's a very growing economy, uh, Mexico. And as you said, Mexico, Peru, so there are opportunities that as well who would love it. And, and talking of um, cactus, I think cactus was my lunch more times than I can count when I was in primary school. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been even even ecologically, it's not that different. Sure. Sure. Cool. Um, perfect, awesome. So now coming to the next part of the podcast, wherein like you know, it's a different offbeat question that we would want to talk to you about is like you know, if you would have had one superpower, um, like you know, so what would that superpower be and why? I'm a family guy at heart, so I'd like to say the superpower of being in different places at once. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to spend more time with my family. I, I live across the country, mm -hmm. so my mother, my sickly father and, and so forth are on the other side of the country mm -hmm. um, and, and so forth. So the superpower if I could get of, of you know, being in different places at once or being in different places within a very short span of time, 
I think I would take that. I would take that because, like I mentioned, time is very important to me, especially time that I spend with people. Mm-hmm. And and I have learned that the hard way. So, yeah, it's. I think that would be one that I would pick, yeah. Wow, wow. so time travel or teleporting uh, is, yes. is how that you're looking at. Cool, Stephen. Yes. Uh, so, given, uh, coming to the last part of the podcast where we're, like, you know, we're doing a lot of activities on the lift. I mean, the academy is doing a lot of sessions, uh, like, you know, there are collaborative sessions online that's happening. And every year we got more and more lifters coming online, like going through the cohort and the alumni is getting bigger and broader. Uh, so what kind of activities do you feel that uh, the alumni must take or must the academy must take that can really help uh, the alumni network to amplify uh, the work that they're doing and, and they cannot to scale. So do you have any thoughts on mine? I do. I, th- I think I, I was part of the LEAF community grant. I think the first LEAF community grant. I led a team that delivered it in Kenya um, that time. I would say that I think more of that, but it also has to be intentional. It has to have a plan. Um, I think at the at the global level uh, we seem to be tighter than at local levels especially i think especially in kenya and and other other places that i've talked to it would be nice for the local communities to be stronger and i think like sort of a bottom-up approach rather than you know up down approach where you have the live community in kenya being really tight the live community in south africa being really tight in Malaysia, in, in in India, and so forth, in Peru, Mexico, and the likes. And and if we can, you know, build those small, small communities, then join them at the top, then we would have a way stronger community than we have right now. Mm-hmm. I feel like even on the online platforms, there should there should be more activity, in country activities. Mm-hmm. Okay. There should be more in country uh, calls and webinars and so forth. If they have to be I think at that level, then you can pull people together mm. and then because at, at the level, at, at our local level, we can address local problems, local challenges, and that sort of thing. At a global level, then we can talk on that scale. I think if, if I was to do it, I would sort of start with the local communities because I feel like we're sort of losing track of, of activities and there's too, it's such a big gap between when we did the last leaf community and, and this time it's been i don't know two three years it's a long time and and, and as such we we need to sort of do that more often keep the community together more often keep the conversations and the networking and it doesn't necessarily need to be physical but there needs to be communications and and, and conversations going people need to be sharing local opportunities i know I know there is a whole, you know, segment at the Leaf Global of sharing opportunities, and we get that, and we appreciate that a lot. Mm-hmm. But obviously, they won't pick as many as we would in Africa, right? Mm-hmm. So, imagine if there was um, someone putting together opportunities for Leafers in Kenya. Mm-hmm. They would be more specific. They would be more, you know, helpful, and they would be more timely as well because. And, and so forth. So it's it's stuff like that that I think could get better. Mm-hmm. But I think the Glyph, Glyph team in the UK does a wonderful job, very good communicators. And, and I think with help and support from the local communities, then we could have one hell of a community and we could help each other out. Wow, wow incredible. So what you're talking about is kind of like a country chapter where the country starts becoming stronger and then once and they do their own things which is more relatable more local more engaging bonder and these dots can then later on connect to become the global dots instead of just doing the global and then at the bottom line so i think building the structure in between yes exactly and and let me let me give you give you an example right um instead of asking leafers to apply for grants to bring the community together Mm -hmm. If the community was already together, mm. you could just fund that, right? Could mm. you could fund the activities, you could fund the community being together because there's a bit more sustainability in that 
Mm-hmm. And, and the community can create resources for itself to keep to keep going so that you just don't do an event this year and then next year there's nothing mm-hmm. okay next year they are asking or we are asking well, what do, does the leaf global team have for us and so forth and so forth mm-hmm. if we could build a community where it's receiving that level of support so that support is coming to you know a team or the whole community or the, just the leadership to be able to facilitate activities and so forth mm-hmm. at least there's stability there mm-hmm. and it doesn't also feel like you're competing against each other for something mm-hmm. feels like you're collaborating now right mm-hmm. and and better use of resources and so forth i don't know i'm just thinking yeah i, I think it's a brilliant idea in context and, and i think at the top level that's what is gonna you're gonna see that um uh, thing happening in the coming uh, months uh, i think maybe in march itself but i think it's a very brilliant uh, thought that you've said uh, so i think the perspective in that and then it gets things rolling and then it becomes more stronger in the roots and then and like you know it, it's easy for us to uh, amplify uh, so i think uh, yes and 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 because we're entrepreneurs and if we see value in the community we can easily be told it's a membership we can make it a membership at mm-hmm. some point we, we can fund our activities we can fund I was we can social activities we can plant trees we are planting a lot of trees in Kenya this year and I was thinking ah why aren't the leafers coming together and doing a project together that of similar nature and the thing is entrepreneurs we can come together and do similar stuff mm-hmm. that affect our communities that build our communities but also create an immense a level of awareness about mm-hmm. the leaf global community and awareness and we can get even closer to the decision makers Mm-hmm. the government and so forth i don't think a one time event will do that but a movement will mm-hmm. right so it's it's that sort of thing and, and i don't know how that uh, no. I, i don't have the details but i would love to have a conversation with my fellow leafers locally here and see how that works out perfect awesome 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 stephen so it's been amazing to uh, have you on the podcast and uh, uh, know your journey from how like you know you started from 2019 and getting a perspective on and it's very interesting to also understand that you know or you realize the aspect that like you know this is what you want uh, or this is what your strengths are this is what your weaknesses are and being very practical around it and then like you know working on towards it and uh, and kudos to you for adding so many customers and growing so far and thank you for the brilliant idea of having country chapters and like you know then uh, the impact would be much better and uh, it's been amazing to have you on the podcast and and thank you for your time and i look forward to seeing you soon because i'm planning a trip again in kenya soon so i think i look forward to meeting you as well uh, in particular to your city uh, so i think uh, but, but thanks for your time that would be nice that that, that would be swell thank you very much for having me today